Good morning. Scripture readings for today are taken from the Old Testament, the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and also from the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 23 to 24. But before we delve into the word, let us pray. O oh Lord, it is always a privilege to come into your presence and to hear your word anew. Lord, as we contemplate your holiness, silence within us anything that would keep us from hearing your voice and obeying it through the power of the Holy Spirit. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. And from the Gospel of John. But the hour is coming, and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, as we continue this new series on discipleship, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, as I mentioned last week, the session is seeking ways to help us stay a little bit more focused on God's will in our lives, and so we are trying something a little bit different this year as we focus on this singular theme of discipleship. And if you were not here last week, I want to encourage you to go and listen to the message so you can kind of better understand why we're focusing on this theme instead of any number of wonderful themes that we could have focused on. But at a minimum, we are trying to be, in this year, uh, by focusing on discipleship, trying to become more like Christ, which is ultimately Christian maturity. And in Paul's great letter to the church in Ephesus, and where he says there in chapter 4, he says, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And when we grow up in the faith, when we become mature in Christ, the process and the, and the outcome of that is transformation. Life is going to be different. It's going to be different. So, you and I are going to be transformed in, in a lot of ways the more and more we lean into this idea and belief of being Jesus' disciple. We're going to be changed. And 12 months from now, we're going to be a very different person than who we are today the more we lean into this invitation to become more like Christ. So if you are game for being part of this transformation, what it means in essence is that you are signing up to be used by God in transformative ways with others, to be used by God in transformative ways in your places of work, 
and to be used by God in transformative ways in, in, in how you set up things and how you coach things and your volunteer life and your work life and your neighborhood life, that you are signing up, in essence, to become a transformed person in Christ. And certainly, that transformation is not a one-size-fits-all transformation because you are created in a very unique way. You're created in the image of God, and you're created in a way to extend grace and blessing to the world in which you encounter. And we are able to do this because of Christ's life, because of His death, and because He has victory over that death through His resurrection. We are then freed up to join in that ministry of reconciliation as ambassadors of Christ. And so you and I get to live out of that victory that we have inherited because of what Christ has done. And so we dare to call ourselves disciples. So just as a quick reminder, what is a disciple? Join with me. A disciple is a follower of Jesus Christ who is centering one's life on Him and is becoming increasingly more like Him. Well, how does this actually get played out? What is it, what can we do that will help us to fulfill this notion of self-identifying as disciples of Jesus Christ, a people who center our lives on Jesus, who are increasingly becoming more like Him. And over these next six weeks, we're going to take a look at all sorts of different commitments that we need to lean into more and more. And the very first one that we are going to take a look at is worship. Worship. Now, a word of caution here as we begin taking a look at these commitments. One of my biggest fears for all of us is that we're going to look at this as kind of like, almost like a spiritual checklist, uh, that we are going to simply just check that off. I got worship, check that off. I got prayer, check that off. I got some fellowship in my life. But I want to suggest that as we talk about these topics and talk about worship and talk about all these other commitments as disciples, I think I'd, I'd like to try to plant this image of a, uh, it is more like nutrients for a tree that the tree needs in order to grow, endure, and embrace a lifetime of faith, not just for one season, but a lifetime of faith that allows us to weather the storms that come our way, that allows us to get through the complexities of life, that these are commitments that will help us more likely get through those moments in life. So this first commitment is worship. And my hope, and I'm just going to assume this, is that you are here today because you seek to worship God. You know, in many ways, we have all sorts of different images in our mind of what it comes to us, perhaps, in our mind's eye of what it means to kind of have this image of what does it mean to worship God? And there's one image in particular that has kind of hit me over the years that kind of comes up in different ways but it's the image of this kind of warm and loving embrace. Can you think of a moment in your own life when someone kind of took you in your arms and suddenly there was like this strange but wonderful sense of calm, wonderful sense of just peace? Maybe it was when you were a child or a teenager or an adult or, or maybe it happened just this morning even. The brace necessarily didn't change everything, but you knew you knew that when you were in that embrace, you were going to be okay. That the craziness of life was kind of put together in this one place. And so when I think of worship, I, I think of almost like this heavenly embrace by my heavenly Father and how eager He is to take me into His presence and to remind me once again of who He is and that everything is going to ultimately be okay. When I think of an image of worship, that is kind of one of the images that I think of. And when we experience that presence, we are transformed more into the disciples that God intends for us to be. We are transformed more into His likeness. And the simple reason is because of whom we worship. You see, worship is fundamentally not about us, but about God. Worship is fundamentally about God. 
I love the old story about the individual who was on a business trip, and they decided to hit a church service near their hotel. And after the service, this individual talked with the pastor and, and really appreciated their message and how much it had blessed them and, and kind, of all, kind of threw in a little passive-aggressive when he said, you know, even though some of the worship time, you know, was not to his liking and all that. And then the pastor actually asked him, said, well, what was it you think God didn't like? And he said, well, I don't know. I don't suppose there was anything God didn't like. I was talking about my reaction. But worship isn't really about me, is it? Friends, it is easy for all of us to get caught up with this primary evaluation of worship that did this worship or that worship meet my needs? Instead, I want to suggest that we need to worship with the primary question of to what degree was the living God given praise and honor and glory throughout our worship today? And to what degree did I participate in that endeavor? So what does it look like to sit in the heavenly presence of God and and worship Him in spirit and truth as the text there in John 4 tells us that Elaine had read with the woman there at the well and Jesus speaking to her? What does it mean to worship in spirit and truth? What does it look like? And certainly over the years, I've experienced all different styles of worship, certainly from mission trips that I've been on, the different churches I've been a part of in life. I feel like I've experienced the gamut. I know I've experienced uh, a huge breadth of styles of worship. One of the most amazing experiences I had, I went to actually a Pentecostal service in Korea where they are, their church uh, has about five, 600,000 people, and they're in an arena, and they have a 24-7 worship service going on, Yoido Full Gospel Church there in Seoul, Korea. Now, that's an experience I, I will never forget. It was just a constant inflow and outflow of people uh, worshiping, worshiping God there. But there's all sorts of different ways in which people worship. But I think here in some of the texts that we've heard read, I think it begins to give us a picture of some of the key pieces of how we go about worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And the one I want to focus on particularly is this text from Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. It is a vision of this heavenly encounter with God, a heavenly encounter with God's presence. And I believe it can help us as disciples of Jesus to stay focused on this primary purpose of worship, to dwell in the presence of the living God and to give Him praise and honor and glory. Verse 1 says there, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the hem of His robe filled the temple. In your mind's eye, can you imagine this scene, this vision that Isaiah is talking about here from this text? I mean, the temple was an enormous structure. It was a place where the people went to worship God. Isaiah tells of the hem of his robe, just this little piece of it filled the temple. And it only took the hem of the robe to fill it all up. Can you hear how this imagery of how big and overwhelming the presence of God is that Isaiah is talking about almost too big for words to contain? It's one of the reasons why I love worshiping in places such as the national parks on the rim of the Grand Canyon or there overlooking the Tetons as we did here just a month ago. It's like the words almost are, are, can't even quite put it to words of the sense of God's majesty, of God's hem filled the temple. And Isaiah is trying to explain this enormity of who God is, that even the temple can't contain God. And as big as the temple is, it will only fill this little piece of, of his robe. And so for Isaiah and for us, worship does have this sense of this overwhelming nature of who God is as we praise and as we worship God. And Isaiah describes these creatures, seraphs, angels, who are praising the name of God. And it says in verse 3, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices who called and the house filled with smoke. I mean, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it's just awesome. Friends, have you ever had your breath taken away from you? 
Have you ever been in a place where you just kind of are just rattled and just shook? Perhaps when you realize the enormity of the moment of what you are about to participate in, I mean, it might be the moment in which you got married, for instance, and all of a sudden you're realizing, oh my goodness, what is going on here? I mean, I'm just feeling the weight of all this. This is amazing and yet totally terrifying and wonderful and all these kind of things going together. And you're just like, you're breathing really heavy. Or perhaps when you stood on the edge of a cliff and you knew if you moved one step forward, I mean, that would be, that would be it. And yet you're at that thin place of life and death and all. Or perhaps it's when you witness the birth of your child. I mean, this overwhelming sense of awe and mystery and wonder and magnificence. There is this side of worship that when you stand in front of the Almighty God, the Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, there's a sense of humbling that takes place there. We are in awe of the presence of God, and we are united in response to that. And the natural response of that is to sing praise, sing to the Lord a new song, as we, as we heard in one of our sermons over the last few months about being on repeat, singing to the Lord a new song, sing to the Lord all the earth, and that includes us. And in Revelation, we heard this read too, that actually it's not just us, but all creatures in heaven and on earth and under the sea, and all that is in them will be singing. We expect to encounter the living Lord, and we expect to sing. It is why we have songs woven throughout our worship service, because we are getting ready for the day in which we will eternally sing God's praises. And my guess is that the eternal tune of the music is not going to be nearly as important as the way in which we are opened up to the presence of the living Lord there. But yet here in the midst of our singing, we recognize that we come in front of this holy God, we come in front of this this risen God, this living Lord, and we fall short and we are compelled to confess. As Isaiah says, he says, woe to me, I cried. There in verse 5, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King, the the Lord Almighty, and, and when we encounter God, we find ourselves in many ways humbled by God's presence, humbled by His holiness, and we need to confess to come clean. And the older I get, the more I can't wait for a time to just come clean before God in worship to recognize who God is and who I am in relationship to Him and just say, Lord, okay, there's something, I I need to just come clean with you about some stuff this week. We sense the presence of the living God and the holiness of God and we fall short. Confession at its most basic level is recognizing what is true about ourselves. Confession is having someone in many ways like, almost like turn on the light in the room And we actually get to see ourselves very clearly. And when we come into the presence of of the light of God, we see ourselves clearly. We realize that we need to confess. We need to seek forgiveness. We see and acknowledge our pride and what we get caught up in as we relate with other people. We, We acknowledge our arrogance that we have all the right answers. We see and acknowledge that we need to, what we need to say with our entire being, with, with words that, that we need to just continually say and say, God, I am sorry. Please forgive me. We are compelled to confess in the presence of God. And then the most beautiful thing happens here in the imagery here in verse 6 says, Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for, to be forgiven. There is nothing quite like it. We are freed from the bondage of our sin. We are freed from the guilt that comes from our sin. We continually say, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. We do this through confessing uh, together and individually and through our prayers in the morning. We confess before our God, because we know that we get caught up in sin. But there's also another aspect of worship that helps us become more like Christ. And, and, and here in Isaiah, it's talked about this way in verse 8, when Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? 
Isaiah heard the voice of the Lord. The the speech of God is the life-giving and life-changing voice that shapes and molds us. And we experience it by the power of the Holy Spirit through the word, through, through the scriptures proclaimed. And it is this very voice which brought the creation into being in Genesis. And God said, let there be light. And God said, let the earth bring forth creatures of every kind. And God said, let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness. In the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word. The Word. God creates through His speech. Through His speech. And that's why we, we study the Scriptures. That's why we hear the Scriptures. That's why we, we, we uh, submit our lives around the Scriptures. We are shaped by this living word which molds us more into the Son's likeness. And as I have said, here am I, send me. Well, I want to invite a friend of mine up here today, Suzanne Nelson, to talk with us a little bit about this notion of discipleship, but particularly in the topic of worship. So, Suzanne, come on up here. And... Um, she is going to help us um, uh, share with us a little bit about her walk with Christ and how worship has really impacted her discipleship and all. But first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, sure. Um, my name is Suzanne, and I am married to Paul, uh, and we have two grown adult daughters, one who lives in New York and one who lives in California. Uh-huh and a little granddaughter. Awesome. And I am a pediatric gastroenterologist, so I'm a physician at Lurie. And for fun, I like to do mosaic art. And I'm actually uh, been working on a piece for the last year for this church. Yes, it is really good, I must say. I'm really excited about it. Uh, And you are involved with a number of different ministries here at the church. Just kind of briefly update us a little bit about those ministries. Sure. So um, Paul and I first started with bringing donuts to youth uh, because we feel like the youth is the future of the church. Um, And uh, we also usher. Mm -hmm. Um, I serve on worship council and I'm a deacon. Mm -hmm. And uh, I enjoy going to Thursday night uh, women's Bible study, and uh, we're involved in a small group. You know, one of the things that we're trying to get a better sense of for all of us, and all of us have different journeys with our discipleship, but how has worship been important to you in your walk with Christ and becoming more and more like Him? Yeah, so I really feel like I'm at my best when I put my relationship with God at the center of my life. Mm. And um, by going to worship service every Sunday, I feel like it really prioritizes for me what's important. Mm. And it really puts me on a good footing for the rest of the week so I can worship God. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have talked uh, with me a little bit about kind of different aspects of worship that really kind of help you become more like Christ as you become more and more a disciple of His. Can you share just a few of those? Perhaps. Sure. Um, so what I really like about the services here, whether or not it's the contemporary service or the traditional service, is that it really gives me a taste of the variety of ways I can worship Christ mm-hmm. throughout the week. Yeah. So, for example, prayer. You know, whether or not we're saying the Lord's Prayer or prayers of the people, prayer um, really allows me to have and to develop a personal relationship with Christ. Yeah. And study, of course, a sermon doesn't, uh, a week doesn't go by where we don't read from scripture or, um, and that really, along with the sermon, really um, causes me to have questions when I leave here. It engages me with my faith and keeps my faith alive. Um, In terms of worship and worship singing, um, that really helps me have and develop a relationship with the Holy Spirit. It opens my heart. And I know this when I'm singing a worship song and my eyes well with tears or I get chills. Um, And then finally, leadership, excuse me, fellowship and service. 
That, I have to admit, was probably the hardest for me um, huh. because I'm an introvert. Uh -huh. And um, for example, COVID, that's an introvert's paradise. <laughs> um, I was quite happy to stay home, look at worship service online, and never having to come in here and <laughs> interact with people that I really felt like I didn't know. Yeah. Um, but once COVID was over, I did come back. And um, I actually volunteered to usher, which was a little bit of a stretch for me. Huh. And what I found was that I really liked it. Huh. And I found that, um, that even though I really appreciate looking at service online when I'm sick or I'm out of town, um, I really get more out of church when I fellowship with others. Um, but really what's important is not what I, my time here for the hour, hour and 15 minutes. What's really important to me is what I do when I leave this church. And um, what the worship service here does for me is that it really helps, helps me with the rest of the week. Right. And um, there's a line in the common book of prayer that says, now go out in the world in peace. And that's what worship service allows me to do. And that's a, I think it's a good place to end our conversation. That's great. Well, thank you, Suzanne. I appreciate that. Wonderful. Uh, join with me in prayer. Father God, we thank you for giving us this opportunity to come to you and worship in spirit and in truth. And we thank you for disciples like Suzanne who kind of help us in that journey to point us in, in, a, in a, a more complete direction as we become increasingly more like your son. So guide us, O oh God, now as we conclude our time of worship through song. In Christ's name, amen.